Welcome back to another Sam.gov Bids Alive episode number 55, where we walk through small business solicitations together on Sam.gov and answer your questions along the way so that you too can start bidding and winning contracts on Sam.gov for your small government contracting business. Today, we will be reviewing six small business solicitations that I've pulled up on Sam that we will be jumping into in just a second. But if you're new here and you don't want to miss future Sam Bids Live episodes, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you can ask your questions live on future streams. And lastly, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to middleman government contracts or just learn how to bid and win contracts, our new LMM book, The Legal Middleman Method, is here. And it is available for purchase if you want to learn to middleman government contracts. You can legally check out the book, <laughs> legally, you can check out the book rather at our website, legalmiddleman.com slash book. Or you can take it to another step further and get more than 40 training videos to get you set up bidding and winning along with all the templates you need for writing proposals, with bidding examples, working with subcontractors, learning regulations, all that you need to know included in the LMM course that you can check out at legalmiddleman.com slash course. So welcome and hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 55. If you are on live with us right now, let me know what state you're representing. If this is your first time being on live with us, let us know that this is your first live as well. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome. Now, while you guys uh, let us know in the chat what you got going on, I'm going to go ahead and give us a sneak peek at the bids we will be covering for today. So bid number one will be Whiteman Air Force Base Firing Range Cleaning Services. Bid number two, kitchen attendants for Nebraska National Guard. Bid number three, yellow ribbon event services. Looks like February 14th, 17th, and 24th. We'll see. Bid number four, maintenance inspection testing of fire sprinkler system. This is for the Coast Guard Academy. Number five, restroom trailer services. And then if we have time, we also have bid number six, transcription and court reporting services. That's going to be with the Army. Hope everybody's week is off to a great start. Hello, hello. We've got El Boogie hanging out with us. Good morning, good afternoon. We've got Najee Vereen just ordered my book. I'm excited for it to come. Absolutely, Najee, we've got your order. Mary Butler, good afternoon. We've got Sean Costley, first time. Welcome, first time. We're also out of Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, Alabama. Another fellow Alabama shout out. The Money uh, John, Maryland, welcome. Kerry Washington, <laughs> rambling goat brother. What's going on, Kerry? Yes, yes, good to see you. It's been a while. Tech and Design from California. Shannon. Um, L.O. I'm not sure. Maybe I maybe it got cut off. Uh, Mary Butler's South Carolina first live. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Aravera, first time from Virginia. Amazing. Cashing out with Nisi out of Florida. Cool, cool. Welcome, guys. Angel Watkins from Illinois. Latifa from Virginia. Shannon from Louisiana. Katina Willis TV from Westland, Michigan. My old stomping grounds. Brian, hey Derek, enjoying the class. And this is my first live from Delaware. Awesome, guys. Thank you for being here with us. And um, you all make it feel warm and cozy. And it's so awesome to have a community to come to every single week. And I hope that you feel the same to come and talk GovCon, um, talk about new questions, and also look at some new bids, which we will go ahead and get started with and kick off our first bid for today. Again, firing range cleaning out of Whiteman Air Force Base. So this bid is due January 25th, total small business set aside. Again, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri. For the description, we do have a, an amendment they're letting us know with the Q&A that was posted. And then for the attachments, looks like we have holidays and family days attachment. It's gonna give us some info on that. Safety sheets, uh, past performance questionnaire. So we know that they're gonna be requesting past performance with their proposal for this. They're giving us some photos, uh, clauses, wage determination. We do have a pricing sheet that looks like it's an Excel. So we'll definitely check that out too. We have a statement of work. We have a combo solicitation and then that amendment that they referenced. So to get started, we will start with the combined synopsis solicitation which is just a few pages long actually it's only three pages much much shorter than what we're 
are typically used to seeing. They're letting us know this is a straight up RFQ request for quotation. And they're reiterating some of the information that we already know, 100% set aside for small business. Did I miss that? It is small business set aside. I don't remember if I covered that already. And again, firing range cleaning services. So site visit information, there will not be a site visit offered. Okay, straight up. Evaluations for this acquisition, this will be best value, okay? Between, they're saying pass performance and price. Pass performance will be based on submission of two pass performance on the attached PPQ that have uh, occurred over the last three years, okay? City, state, local contracts with a similar service. And then the offer, if you don't have that, shall provide, uh, let's see, references from private industry sources that are not prohibited from furnishing information to the government, right? Doesn't have to be government pass performance only. That's what they're indicating here. Price will be evaluated based on lowest price proposed, right? So because it's best value, but it's going to be, mm, they're saying it's best value, but they're going to be putting a lot of weight into these PPQs, it sounds like. Because in terms of the information being submitted, it's going to be basic company info name POC. So just your company, typical company info, revenue, employees. And then for the PPQ, here's the references. And they did reference a pricing sheet. So that's probably a timely thing to look at as well, just to kind of compare what they're asked so far and what this is going to be asking us. So for this, Pricing sheet, it's straightforward. They're letting us know it is a base plus four options plus a six month extension. So a nice stackable contract and then monthly rate times 12. And that'll give you 12 months in a year. So very straightforward pricing. Just want to know what's it going to cost monthly to clean the firing range. We have a statement of work. And that is one page. Essentially, they're telling us the contractor shall clean the 25 meter range in accordance with guidance set forth in the OSHA standards. They're also telling us the use of an explosion proof HEPA filtered vacuum to remove heavy accumulations of lead dust and nitrocellulose is kind of what you're in for with the statement of work on this. Like, like I said, it's just that one page. They did give us the Q and A, so we'll see what additional guidance contracting is giving us other than the range. Are there any other areas needed to be cleaned? And they're saying, nope, this is only for range cleaning. Is the ammunition, uh, is the ammunition rather used lead free? When using frangible rounds, it is lead free. We are authorized now to utilize ball rounds, which does contain lead. So, you know, kind of depends, you know, op operate at your own risk. Confirmation of the part number, that is the part number that we have. As far as when I search, I can find them online. That's the answer. And then do you have any analytic analyticals for the debris or the filters? And the answer was, once we have a full barrel, a pickup is scheduled. The barrels remain sealed once full. We typically fill a drum after two to three months, depending on the, uh, the volume. And as far as storage, the drums remain behind the fire range until pickup. Okay, so some pretty practical, straightforward questions. This would be from your competition or competitors, it's hard to tell if it's one or multiple companies that have submitted those questions. But nonetheless, I think a pretty straightforward, straightforward pricing, short and sweet scope, no site visit even, they're really asking you to rely on the information they've provided uh, to be able to quote and go after that. So I think we will go ahead and hello everybody, hello, hello. Everybody's here with us. SR Smith says, I recently, uh, I currently have an LLC, but I moved to another state. You'll likely have to re-register your LLC in whatever state you've moved to. And you might have to, um, I, it's not it's not like my jurisdiction. I'm more GovCon. This is more business specific. But I would contact your uh, state department and let them know that you moved and ask them if you have to do some sort of transfer. Because things like sales tax and things like that can vary and will vary from state to state so you just want to make sure uh hello timothy what's going on man good to see you lloyd uh, massingill been enjoying the book 
plus viewing the content. Hey, that's awesome, man. Glad that you, a lot of you guys are getting the book. If you haven't yet, legalmiddleman.com slash book. It's affordable. It's a normal price of a book. We ship it out pretty quick. We ship it out. We don't drop ship it. So I actually control all the shipping myself and I pack most of the orders myself, believe it or not. So if you've gotten a book, I probably packed it for you. And it's just the first iteration of the book as well. So we'll continue to make improvements. If there's, you know, a typo here and there, we'll, we'll fix that. But um, I'm super proud of it. And if it's, if you've been watching and you're into the space, I highly recommend you, you check out the book. Um, I try to make it affordable for everybody. Uh, so bid number two, kitchen attendance for, I'm assuming this is Nebraska. Yeah, Lincoln. Yep, Lincoln, Nebraska. National Guard. So this is going to be for the Army National Guard. This bid is due February 13th. Small business set aside. Again, kitchen attendance. So are we thinking like, are we thinking staffing perhaps? Sounds like putting warm bodies to work. This is a request for quote. Full kitchen attendant services, 18 days. So it's just more like, hmm. Actually, I don't know. Full kitchen attendant services, 18 days from May 1st, 2024 through 30th of April, 2025. The 18 days kind of threw me, unless you're saying it's eight, 18 days over this one year period. So we'll have to, we'll go into it with, with that in mind. Period of performance are 4th and 5th of May. Okay, it does actually look like it's selective dates. Uh, August 3rd, 21st, 22nd, September. Okay, so it's 18 days throughout the year. So it's it's not like a full-time thing. It's like, hey, we need you on one or once or twice a month, something like that. And they're kind of saying item 0001. So we're going to just believe this to be a CLIN 0001. And then CLIN 002, partial kitchen services, six days. And then it looks like, yes, they're giving us options. Base plus one, two, three, and four or with a six, six month extension. So base plus four plus six months. There's a site visit actually in a few days from now, January 25th. Again, quotes are due in February. Okay, so what do we got for attachments? We've got clauses, we've got a sample quote form. We have the evaluation, which is nice. They've broken that out separately. We have the facility layout with tables and chairs. Just help us get a visual, I suppose. Three recommended cleaning supp uh, supplies and chemicals. So just recommended cleaning supplies and chemicals. The three is the document number, then wage determination, then a statement of work, and then a Q and A. So I think we'll look at the sample quote form first. Looks like it's gonna be, once again, rather straightforward. And we're just basically met with company info, registered as Sam. Is there a prompt pay discount that you're offering or not? company representative name and your cage code. And then straight into the pricing cleans that we just reviewed. So they want it per day. And then the total will be the multiplier out. So 18 days, six days, 18 days, six days across all base and option years. So an incredibly straightforward pricing sheet, which takes us to past experience performance, government or non-government contract number. So it looks like they're asking for two. It's interesting. Like we haven't technically, they haven't asked it. We might see it in the evaluation uh, attachment that they gave us, but they're literally just almost teeing up our proposal for us because it's like, remember when we talk about, for those of you who follow us, when it comes to writing proposal responses, we don't ever want to start with a blank sheet of paper, right? Instead, we want to quickly build an outline. What we're seeing in this bid is the government's essentially really giving us a nice outline in order at which point it's already teed up for us to simply plug and chug. And that's something we don't always see. But the reason I'm pointing it out is this is kind of a, a milestone. This is a goal you want to get to in your business. If you've never done this before, or you just started bidding contracts on Sam, um, this is very much the exact type of stuff you will see requested in past performance. And they're just putting the colon after each of these so you can plug and chug your answer, right? Um, so dollar value, type, place of performance, date of award, you know, ongoing or complete status. If you subcontracted it, right? We talk about a lot, a lot about a legal middleman here and then POC for references. So it, it appears to be two, two past performances they're asking for. Then they bring us to 
The last thing, which would technically be your technical, no pun intended, but the management control plan built very nicely. That's what I'm saying. This is almost a, an outline price, past performance, technical things we always talk about. They managed to do it for us in two pages. We essentially have to respond to it and fill it out. This says should include, but is not limited to a management strategy. Boom. Okay. And then oversight for contract employees to perform, uh, to conform to the PWS. Boom. Another one. Hourly wages paid per labor category. Because I do believe they gave us a wage determination. And then the hiring source for the employees. And then the number of contractor employees and estimated hours per weekend. So you could literally break this down into like six or seven bullets. Or, you know subheaders, subsections for the management control plan and respond to each of those. And then wrapped up, that will make up your management control plan. So if you're saying, Derek, I, I don't know, I've never done this before. I don't know how to write a management control plan. You, In this instance and many others, you are breaking down what they're giving you into sub tiers and then you respond to those. And then you tie that back up together and then you have your completed document. And then you did a probably fairly decent job if you've done that. Then you have to look at your past performance and your pricing. So I really, really love this as an example for you guys because like I said, it's a great milestone to try to reach if you're new to this. I do wanna look, like I said, at the method of evaluation, however, to see how that lines up with what they've just asked from us. So the government will award this contract resulting um, to, 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 to those uh, to what's most advantageous to the government, price and other factors considered. Number one, technical management control plan. And then they're giving you a technical rating. So they're going to break this down by blue, purple, green, yellow, or red. And they're giving you a definition for each. So after you write this, then you want to come back to this as part of your review process and say, you know, how would I rate this? Or better yet, give it to somebody else, you know, do red team or something and have a colleague or somebody else assign you a color based on these definitions. I'm not going to read the definitions, but um, you're either like exceptional or, you know, at one extreme or you don't meet the requirements at the other end. And then if you're somewhere in the middle, you're going to be somewhere in the middle with these colors. So you want to search, shoot for outstanding as much as you can. And then past performance, they're giving us a confidence rating. So from one end, it's going to be substantial confidence Government has high expectation. And then on the low end, it's unknown confidence or actually no, no, that's, that's neutral. Um, no confidence is the low end. And based on what you gave them, the government has no expectation that you'll be able to do this. It's better to get a neutral than a no. Neutral means there is no record of past performance. And I know a lot of you guys freak out because you don't have it, i.e. you can use the subs if you're gonna be using the legal middleman approach. But if you're not, that's just fine. Know that you still get a neutral rating if you don't have it. So that's what this document is telling us. How will the winner winning bidder be chosen? It will be based off of what's most advantageous when the technical ratings and the past performance ratings are evaluated, essentially. <clears throat> Rated is what I was going to say, but it's too many ratings. So pretty good example, I think. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> HB to God says, you're back live. I missed the beginning because of work, but I'll definitely catch up on Spotify later. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. And yes, we, we started the new year strong. Um, we did some episodes before uh, Christmas time and the holidays as well. But yes, we are back into the new year strong. And we are marching through. Power Solutions. Can you give your opinion on applying for search such as 8A? I heard this is the best way to win bids. So I don't recommend that you go out and try to like collect all the set asides like their Pokemon, right? I prefer you grow into set asides because many folks think the set aside is going to be their ticket out, right? Like this is going to, you know, I did a video a long time ago. It got very low views. So you probably haven't seen it, but what happened was, is that in the video, it was like a satire video. So I did this joke where I got my, I got my 8A registration and then I got up and I went and like opened the door and I came back and I sat down. Let me know if you've seen this video. You probably haven't. Um, it's hilarious. Actually go and try and find it on the channel if you can, if you haven't. Um, and then I sat back down and I said, okay, now the contracts can start walking their way, you know, into my office. 
because some people actually think that's how it works and it's not their fault, but it's what they're told. Just like getting on a GSA schedule, getting the phone call. I just got one two days ago. Uh, we have some companies we need to get this uh, on this GSA schedule. It's a guaranteed contract, blah, 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 blah. Are you interested? And, you know, little known fact, I, I like to, in my past time, I'm a little sick and twisted. So I like to pretend that I don't know anything with these people that call and kind of, you know, waste their time. Because if they're wasting their time on me, that means they're not going out and screwing one of you guys who maybe don't know better yet. Um, so super tangent, but I'm just having a little bit of fun with this. I know the question was more about such as 8A. I recommend you grow into it, learn how to bid, get a few contracts under your belt first, and then go after your set of sides because you can go after full and open contracts. You can also go after total small business side of side contracts, more importantly, um, without any special designation that can take months and sometimes cost you some money. Uh, so without going too much into it, that's my general opinion on the set of sides. Um, let's see. Lloyd said, if you were fortunate enough to get a capabilities briefing, would you recommend working into your elevator pitch to the con into contracting that you're in the regular routine of middle manning? Um, that's not the approach that I would recommend. Instead, I would, that's the purpose of the umbrella strategy, right? And some of you know that some don't. The umbrella strategy is a way of grouping together like kind services, specifically if you're in services, building a services agency, which I recommend um, because your umbrella statement is going to be instead what you lead with in a conversation, especially like in a capabilities briefing. So you can more easily explain to contracting, right? This, the services and the mission and everything that you offer and provide to their overall um, you know, agency, right? So I would prefer that you lead with the umbrella strategy that ties together your, your capabilities rather than um, saying, hey, we do legal middlemaning because you didn't even say legal middlemaning. You said middlemaning. Okay, middlemaning has a bad connotation because it, it can mean doing it illegally because a lot of folks use it in that context. So I, I just wouldn't even say you middleman, like especially in a, uh, a formal setting. I wouldn't ever tell contracting that you middleman. Working with subcontractors or working with teaming partners is what we say on the channel because that is the more professional way to lead, right? Middlemaning is just the way for folks to understand it who don't know the space yet. But once you're in the space, it's not middlemaning, it's subcontracting and teaming, right? So if you have to say that, you can say that. But again, to your question, I prefer you lead with what your, your umbrella is. And don't, again, don't call it an umbrella say this is what our company does, right? The umbrella is what you do behind the scenes to help you get there to answer the question. I hope I hope that helps and that makes sense. Um, Barry says, can you explain how to relate to your sub that you pay on a net 30? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not any more complicated than that. I mean, most, most companies are familiar with invoicing, right? Most companies don't get paid before doing the work or get paid instantly. Um, usually they do the work and they'll send you an invoice. So it's the same thing, like you're not reinventing the wheel on this. You tell the sub you do the work and then you can send us your invoice. The only difference is you're a government contractor. So you'll also be invoicing the government and you explain to them that as soon as you get paid, sub gets paid or they get paid. Right. Um, so it's, it's a concept they should be very familiar with. Uh, there shouldn't be too many uh, issues with that. Is there an annual fee for Sam? Absolutely not. There is no fee for Sam. There's lots of companies that, Help you get registered in SAM, this, that, and the other thing. Um, no money ever, right? No money ever for SAM.gov. If you're seeing that, that's because somebody's trying to take you for a ride and run the other way. Can you please apply, uh, provide your opinion on attending conferences and events? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a good use of time for new government contractors. I think it's a distraction. Just like going after set-asides as a new government contractor, I think is a distraction. I don't think set-asides or conferences are bad. I don't say they're bad, but I think when you're a team of one, two, or three, it's you, it's you and a spouse, you and a business partner, you don't have the luxury of time or the supplemental activities to be focusing all on that. When there's live bids, you could actually be bidding on a winning, which is the direct route for you to actually start getting revenue in for the business. I think you can grow into set-asides. I think you can grow into conferences 
I think you can grow into capability briefings as you gain the luxury of getting your head above water to start breathing. But if you're literally holding your breath, putting resources, effort, and money to try to get this GovCon business off the ground, I, I, I think you need to stick with the meat and potatoes of your business first and then grow into the supplements, not start with the supplements and avoid the, the one very thing that's going to make or break you, right? So I'm, I'm very passionate and believe in that um, a lot. So let's go ahead and uh, amazing questions, guys. Amazing questions. Let's go ahead and look at the next bid. Maintenance inspection testing of the fire sprinkler system for the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Yes, very good questions. Uh, February 19th, this is due. SDVOSB, set aside for vets. Site visit is recommended, scheduled for January 25th at 9. So good to know. In terms of attachments, we have clauses. We have wage determination. We have the map. Device list for per building. We have the sprinkler schedule, and then we have a statement of work. So, where do we want to start with this one? We'll see if this strictly is just the clauses, or if it's just, or if it's also the solicitation. So, this is forty-nine pages. Provisions and clauses. I just want to see if they stuck anything else in here. We've got our reps and certs <clears throat> in here as well. Looks like, yeah, okay. This is strictly clauses. Wage termination, let's take a peek at the map, kind of uh, really going in backwards on this one. So this is the map for the facilities. And we'll be looking somewhere, find somebody who knows how to read maps to help you to navigate the sprinkler system. Device list. This one's four pages and it is manufacturer, year, location. So letting us know the fire hydrant list, backflow preventer list. So that is important. And this is a pricing sheet. And the LO, right? LO, one, one lot. Basically just one price for each. And they're breaking this down into a base plus four as we do have these different tabs. So all of this is all for the base here. So it's broken down into 24 sub clins. And each of these, I call them sub clins, we'll just call them clins. Each of these clins have their own respective sub clins, A, B, and C. So monthly inspection, quarterly inspection, annual inspection, okay? But it's just one price for each. So pretty straightforward pricing on that one. And all we have left is a statement of work. So we don't have any formal solicitation document. It looks like price only. We're not seeing requests for past performance. We're not seeing any sort of technical requirement. And the statement of work is gonna tell us exactly the work that needs to be done. And then we're gonna fill out the pricing sheet. So, you know, I haven't seen Q and A posted anything like this. So we could ask Kathy if, you know, in terms of attached documents that they want us to fill out if it truly is just the pricing worksheet but looks like a an actual solid contract for base plus four once again simplified uh fart art <laughs> far part 13.5 simplified procedures okay we're teaching this in the class right now but this raises that simplified acquisition threshold guys raises it from 250K to 7.5 million, which allows you to move in the same way you would for uh, bids that are beneath simplified acquisition, especially if you're legal middle money. Instead of doing it up to 250K, it allows you to do it up to 7.5 million. I'll just plug this in to show you the actual um, from acquisition.gov. I don't know if you could see it here. 
This subpart authorizes the use of simplified procedures for the acquisitions of supplies and services in the amounts greater than the simplified acquisition threshold, exactly what I was just saying, but not to exceed 7.5 million. So if you ever see that, and it, or if you've ever seen in the past, if you've ever seen in the past a contract that was awarded for more than 250K, but you're like, man, they're just, they're subbing that out. They're doing a legal middleman, but it's over 250K. They may not even be working with a similarly situated entity. How are they doing that? Um, well, if it's set aside for total small business, well, this one's actually SDVOSB. Um, so they would still have to meet their, uh, actually, it's tough to meet your 50% on this one if it's set aside for SDVOSB. Um, but for the rest of it, it's actually interesting. I don't know if contracting realizes what they're doing. Um, actually, they're doing it more for contracting's part because it allows them to still use simplified procedures, but it's not going to change much for us, the bidders, since it's SDVOSB. If it was total small business set aside, it would open up, you know, the context window for us as if it was beneath the set, the sat, but it can still raise it up to 7.5 million for simplified procedures, but you still have to meet your minimum self-performance limits so that the money's going where it's supposed to go. In this instance, a minimum to 50% uh, to veteran owned small businesses. But nonetheless, I was still trying to demonstrate our FAR part 13.5, uh, which we don't always see or get to point out. But uh, feel free to research that more on your own, as I was just showing you in the other screen. So cool stuff. Wasn't expecting that. So that's good that we got to group that in as well. Najee says, if you are doing the middleman route, are you required to go to the site visits? No, you have the subcontractor uh, represent your company. It's important that you're on sign. It's important that your company is on the sign-in sheet. That way, if the site visit is mandatory, then your presence was was there as they are representing your company as your teaming partner. Um, otherwise you would be prevented from bidding. Ricky says, thanks uh, by live bid under general information, there's updated inactive date that the bid is due. What do you work with? I mean, the bids have to be active. If it's inactive, I would just move on. Um, a lot of times contracting doesn't update things on the back end. If I'm understanding the question properly. Uh, yummy yummy says, so after you read the solicitation, then you go looking for a sub and then you plug their information into past performance and pricing, etc. So yeah, you always want to understand like reading, 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 right? Always walk before you run, always read before you write or contact subs, right? Because for one, you have to make a bid, no bid decision first, meaning you have to decide if it's going to be worth your time, uh, not only to respond to this thing, but to even go after the subs. So first you have to make a strong case that this fits your, your short list of criteria of what a good bid to go after looks like for your business, something that you think you can be competitive and compliant on to go after, right? So that's always box number one. And that comes from reading as what you're uh, suggesting here. And then once you do make that, then you can start to go on to these subsequent pieces like um, you know, maybe drafting a, a RFQ to send to a sub so that you have that ready to go. If you do get a sub on the phone, have a discovery call with them. Seems like they could be a good fit. They're not going to cut you out. Things like that. You want to you want to weed all that out um, during that first discovery call. And if it seems like it potentially is good, you can send them over the information, right? Which means you have to read it first to your question. Um, and then also, if it's a site visit or something like that, you let them know what the next steps are. Or if it's just you know straight quote, then you you gauge if they're really interested and kind of let them know what the process would look like. Um, and then help them as they need so that then, yes, you can plug and chug the information that they're giving you. But at the end of the day, you don't just take a, a sub or teaming partner's information and give it to the government. You never do that. Right? It has You have to make it part of your own quote. OK, so you build it into your own quote, of course, on your own letterhead, with your own margins um, and with your own proposal, et cetera. You're just working with this company as a partner if you decide to move forward with that company. And you by far give out the best information on YouTube. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm glad that it helped. Uh, what is that number on Sam? Um, actually, I already closed it out, Tim, but I can pull it back up. And I'll just have to uh, drop it in the link below. I'm just going to drop the sam.gov link in the chat. So hopefully you can grab it there. All right, 
cool stuff. Um, Sean says, is there average time, font, time frame when an opportunity is announced and the actual bid is due? It actually varies greatly. Um, just too many is frustration, mine included. Sometimes you'll see a bid posted and then it's due in three days. Does not seem like fair uh, small business competition. Other times, depending on how large the requirement is, I mean, a bid can initially come out and then it's not due for a year. Like they can be that big. And then everywhere in between. Most of what we look at, we're looking at kind of like a one to two month window. So like a 30 to 60 day window is probably what you could expect. Do all SDVOB set asides require? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, so limitations on subcontracting apply to the, the um, socioeconomic categories regardless of dollar value of the contract. So total small business is different than 8A hub zone veteran owned woman owned, right? For those, the money needs to go right where it's it's going, which means where it needs where it's being earmarked for, right? Construction, 15%, professional services, 50%, right? But when you're looking at a small business contract, well, all of us already are small business in accordance with our um, our size standard revenue um, with whatever next code it is that we're going after. So then we are already meeting any level of percentages. And then further, if we're working with a small business subcontractor, um, we're just really like triple underscoring that because then it'll be a similarly situated entity. So yeah, when it comes to those socioeconomic statuses, regardless of the dollar value, the self-performance limits have to be hit. The money needs to go where it's meant to go. And that's the difference between middlemanning and legal middlemanning, right? Middlemanning, you just give it out to whoever regardless without understanding the regulations. Legal middlemanning is what we teach again in the book, in the course and how to make sure the money's going where it's supposed to go so that the government's happy, you're happy, your teaming partner is happy, everybody's happy. It's not that hard to understand, but you just have to apply it. Hopefully that makes sense. Our next bid is, and we're just plowing through these today, guys. We even have six, we've got an extra bid today. Uh, bid number five, if I'm not mistaken, is restroom trailer services for the Air Force, Joint Base San Antonio. This is due January 26th, small business set aside. Again, Fort Sam Houston, 562991 NAICS code, septic tank and related services. In terms of documents, we have a schedule of supplies, clauses, Wage determination, statement of work, solicitation, and an amendment. Actually, just going to take a peek at that amendment first. This is two pages, and this is just answers to questions. So, guys, um, always submit questions to contracting when you have them. It's a, it's also a great indirect way to let contracting know that you're serious and that your company exists by asking questions. Re watching and reading and reviewing the questions also gives you a gauge of, well, I'll say the quality of your competitors. And in some instances, the number of your competitors, because if there's one question, doesn't mean there's only one person bidding on it. Could just mean there's not a lot of questions for it because it's straightforward. But if you receive like 30 pages of questions, well, we know that's not just from one or two companies. Um, a lot there, there's like a lot of interest, right? So you take it all with a grain of salt. But these are the, the, the kind of uh, the tea leaves, the writing on the wall, if you will, that you can kind of start to read into. But uh, very first question, is there an incumbent? If so, what is the incumbent name and contract number? Guys, I always tell you to ask this because why not? You can take this number and you can look it up in FPDS. So let's go ahead and do that, fpds.gov. We're a little bit ahead of schedule today. We have a little bit of extra time. So fpds.gov, federal procurement data system.gov. We take the existing award number and it's telling us the value of this contract and the action obligations for this one looks like there's just one and it's 27,200 there. Okay. So like there's the magic number. Let me see. This is four months of restroom trailer services. So, you know, it's, and look, guys, number of offers received previously, two, only two people bid on this. Everybody's thinking that they've got to get on a GSA schedule or they got to go to Unison Marketplace. Two, 
Okay. And I know it's not a lot of money. It's 27 K um, <clears throat> for the service. But if you're trying to get started in this, like we'll see what's required for this bid, but it's, it's already shaping up to be pretty straightforward. Now, the easier it is, the more competition that's going to be right, which is also going to crush your margins, right? But they only received two. <laughs> like it, it's so it's it's arguably so easy. I will uh, I'll digress though. It's just you know some people they kind of get in their heads. This isn't easy. I'm not making light of government contracting. I'm the last person to make light of government contracting. It is like learning another language. But when it comes to actually doing the work, we, we can sometimes get ourselves so geeked out um, and, and make it feel like hopeless or like there's no way we can do this. But when we look and we saw that there was only two bidders, it, it should give you some hope. I'm not insinuating that that's always the case, but very often it's under 10. Very, very often it's under 10. Part of the reason I do this show is to increase competition for small businesses because it helps everybody. Anyways, the solicit, uh, is this still the amendment? It's saying this is still the amendment. It's not though. Uh, it is and it isn't. They're putting amend the word amend in three different attachments. So it's actually unclear what they have going on here. The basis for award for this is going to be best value. Factor one is going to be lowest total price. And factor two is going to be if you check the box for the technical acceptability. And I can just already tell you that's going to meet whatever standards they need for the trailer services. And really what we're most interested in for this, I think, is just our statement of work. Cleaning, maintenance, replacement. We did see in that uh, the FPDS contract, we did see four months. So we don't know if this is four months. We don't want to make that assumption. But they're saying once weekly at Camp Bullis and once weekly at Randolph. So they just want to know what's it going to be per week and maybe they'll let you know if they want to extend it, right? It could have been extended. And here's some photographs. It's just a trailer. It's a restroom trailer. So this is probably something that you would rent unless you own or would like to buy and you want to use it on other contracts, but probably wouldn't recommend that. Don't recommend it overhead. So you'd probably rent it. So that's... That's a very, um, it's a very small trailer and for 27,000, uh, again, we would have to know if the duration matches up. We would have to know if the number of units match up could be different. And we don't get to see the old solicitation docs on what this was for. So it's not a, a straight apples to apples, um, comparison, which is where then you could ask those, con uh, those questions, the contracting, those intelligent questions that are going to allow you to help uh, shape your pricing uh, strategy for this. Make sense? Juan says, how do more bidders help everybody? Well, it helps the country. So I was taking it from a more macro view because uh, the more small businesses that are becoming innovative, being competitive, it drives the country forward, right? It's good for the economy. It's good for the overall, you know, if it's just one company that's sitting around winning all the contracts, all the time, they're going to be kind of fat and lazy. They're not going to be innovative. And um, we're not all going to kind of benefit that from a macroeconomic uh, standpoint. So that's kind of what I was meaning by that. And bid number six, we have transcription and court reporting services. Is this something um, I've been talking about more and more? I've been actually choosing to show more of these types of bids. Not these types, but these exact uh, scope of bids, because this is an example of something that you may not even think of in the commercial space. But then when you come to the GovCon space, you learn that government buys things and they buy things differently and they buy different things. <laughs> right. Uh, and I actually, if you're on the email list, I just sent out an email yesterday. I did updates literally to this 
um, to this point in our, our free federal contracts masterclass. It's available to everybody. Just go to govkinmethod.com if you want to check that out. Um, I can actually drop the link for that. But what I what I added, I did an update to that kind of for 2024. And what I added to the second part of that is it is a different set of rules. And the biggest mistake that most new small businesses make when they come to GovCon, just put it in the chat for you guys, it's totally free, is that they bring the set of rules that they know and understand and that were taught. So it's not, it's not anybody's fault taught in the commercial space, like where, you know, specialization and differentiation is what sets you apart in the commercial space. That's very true, but that's consumers and those who are shopping you, you know, you, you want to work with, you know, if you're going to work with a roofer, for example, you want a company that does roofing, 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 you don't want to do a company that does roofing and, you know, mowing the lawn and plowing the snow and all these other things, because you're going to feel like they're a jack of all trade master of none. But when you come to GovCon, instead of being customer focused or company focused, the government is mission focused. Government wants to work with companies that understand the needs, understand the mission and the services of things that they need and buy all the time, which means it's not necessarily a problem that you have a, like I say, umbrella of services that you offer that are mission focused with a lot of overlap with what the government's needs are, or a lot of overlap with the bids that are on SAM.gov, right? That's who the government is looking to do business with because you get it, right? And they want to work with somebody who gets doing business with the government. And it is different than the commercial space. So I talk a lot more about that in the free federal contracts masterclass. Link is down below for that. I just want to let you know I updated that over the weekend. So if you haven't checked it out or if you're not in that, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the link is there for you. Um, and what I was getting to with this transcription services now, we'll come back to my screen, is that this isn't something in the commercial space you would ever think to buy. But the reason that I'm showcasing more on purpose uh, when we do these bids, for example, this is something that the government buys a lot of. And I don't see a lot of folks bidding or going after these. And it's a lot of the same kind of small businesses because they're in and they get it. But man, it is not, it's not necessarily a very complicated uh, scope to get in. And the more you get into it, a lot better you're going to get. And there's just a lot of opportunity for contracts like this as one example, something we wouldn't necessarily think of. That's my point. So for, we have a wage termination. We have a pricing schedule, contractor info sheet. Looks like a solicitation and an amendment. We'll start with the solicitation. So our first SF1449 of the day, instruction to offers your quote. They're straight up telling us what's what do you got to put in your proposal? And then after, how's it going to be evaluated? Very nice of them. So the quote shall consist of contractor info sheet, which is going to be right here. Just your basic company information. Doesn't look like anything too scary. And then identification of key personnel, including contract manager and the POC for that. That's A. B, uh, filled and complete the rates and pricing sheet. Do we have one of those? We do. They're giving us that separately. So rate and pricing sheet per visit, per hour, per shipment, per page, and then percentage of expedited rate, rate schedule percentage for different days delivery. Okay. All type of terminology, if you get into court reporting, um, you're going to become very familiar with because they ask for this on all of those. And then, well, they didn't say it, I don't think, but also you're going to need your SF1449 form completed here as well. Quotes that do not provide all the above will be considered non-conforming, of course. And then for the evaluation, the quote shell will contain the vendor's best terms for a price standpoint. The government will evaluate for award purposes by adding the price for all labor and materials. So they're saying this is a TNM, time and material contract, and the dollars allocated at award will be an estimate for the base year requirement. So you're going to get paid. It's not like a firm fixed price contract where they give you, you're awarded, okay. You perform, you get paid, here you go. It's time and material. So you're not gonna get paid for work that you didn't do if you end up doing less work. Um, you're not necessarily uh, like incentivized 
to do the contract more efficiently because then you'll just get paid less. That is one of the differences between a TNM and a firm fixed price contract. We don't see TNM a lot. We typically deal with FFP contracts. We have a statement of work, base plus two option years. So they're letting us know this is a three-year contract. Pretty nice. And then we do have our pricing CLINs, which will reflect, hang on, hang on, the service itself. Then we have um, C drills and then the option periods. So that's exactly what we saw before. They're gonna reflect the POP. This contract's gonna kick off February 12th of this year and go through 2025. Can't believe next year is 2025, and that will continue like that through 2026 with the delivery schedule. And then that probably should be it for what's required because they led with the proposal and evaluation information, so we don't have to look for that any further. There was an amendment, and the amendment was just extending the due date to February 5th. So that's nice. And yeah, that's essentially it for this one at a high level. So guys, we actually got to cover um, six today. Definitely check out the master class. It's totally free. If you're just getting started, maybe this is your, you're new here. This is your first live, or you just haven't done it yet. It's really jam packed with a lot of great stuff. And you can also uh, get the book if you're interested in it. We also have our course. If you're ready to take things to the next level and actually start bidding, it's going to make bidding so much just more effective for you because there's a lot of stuff that you don't have to reinvent the wheel on. So amazing turnout today, guys. Smash the like button, subscribe to the channel. We are starting the year strong. Um, so keep the questions coming. For those of you who are watching this on replay, let me know down in the comments, team replay as well. And I uh, look forward to hanging out with you guys some more next week as we keep 2024 rolling. So that will do it for today, guys. Had a blast. We actually went through six bids, so that's really cool. And you guys had some amazing questions. So kudos to you all as well. So take care. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys on the next Sam Bits Live. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.